Hello everyone and welcome to Fox Studios. Uh, tonight's broadcast is in, made in partnership with Anartem and Frame of Reference Entertainment. We're joined here by the creative forces behind In the Mind's Eye. And first of all, I hope everyone's safe during this time of crisis. And to start things mm -hmm. off, uh, I'd like each of you to uh, give a brief introduction and talk a, a little bit about, about your roles in the film. So first off, writer, director, Callum Gibbs. Hey, Callum. Hi. Uh, thank you, Fabio, for doing this. We really appreciate it. Uh, I'm the writer director of the film, uh, uh, co-founder of Frame of Reference Entertainment, and this was our first film that we did under the production company. Next, we have the producer, Rochelle Goldsmith. Uh, yeah, you can just call me Rochelle. Um, yes, I'm the producer and the other side of that co-founder uh, of Frame of Reference, and um, I was the producer um, in the mind's eye. Next, we have Sarah Ann. Hi, Sarah. Hey, how's it going? Um, I'm Sarah Navratil. I play Greer in the film. Um, and kind of, I guess, was the one who made Kellen write the short. <laughs> that is true. That's true. <laughs> Next, we have Richard Neal. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Richard, and um, I play Andrew in the film and uh, was cast by the director, Kellen, and the producer, Sarah. It was a pleasure to work with them. Again, we worked on a previous film, but we're focusing on this film now. Casting uh, directors. <laughs> yeah. Coming up next, we have the DP, Marty. Hey, Marty. What's up? I don't got a lot to say except for, yeah, I was the DP. What's up? <laughs> and a few words. <laughs> the editor, Tyler Brabner. Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm the editor, and this is my uh, first project with Kellen. Last but not least, Isaias Garcia. Hey everyone from uh, Toronto, Canada here, and uh, I was a composer on the film, and uh, it's good to be here. So uh, my first question goes to Kellen, director. Uh, so where did the idea for this project come from? Sarah, Sarah spoiled this a little bit. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> And uh, it started with Sarah. Um, well, we wanted to, we had a hard time getting uh, some of the projects off the ground for a couple of years that we wanted to do. And so we opened up a company and Sarah had kind of presented a couple ideas of uh, stories to do. And, and um, one of them kind of caught my eye and it was this idea that she had about a character that people's memories and what that can do to someone's psyche and, and where it can take them. And, and she wanted to explore it as an actress, and I wanted to explore it as a writer director. So she kind of handed it over to me and said, "Take it, do do what you want to do with it, and then we'll come back and we'll and we'll kind of work on it to the, from there." And then that sprouted into a um, into us creating a short film uh, with the company and uh, partnering with Evanit, who funded the film and who like backed the project completely. Um, and and it was it was just exciting. It, it was the first time that I had taken an idea from somebody else and tap into something. It would, usually I come up with things myself, but um, but Sarah kind of approached me with it and it was just such a cool, it's a, kind of an idea that we've seen before with people taking people's memories, but the way in which we wanted to approach it and that's what intrigued me the most was Sarah said, what, is, what does this do to somebody if they have too many memories in their head? And uh, that's what we did. So uh, Rachel, um, so how did you and Callan meet? Like. Uh, what was the story behind that? Uh, uh, it's probably almost seven years at this point. Uh, we met in film school together. Um, I was I was actually in a director's program at the school, so I ended up in Kellen's program, and um, I ended up, you know, finding that I like I leaned more toward the logistics and production, but uh, we did meet in a director's program. So speaking of logistics, like what, what were some of the logistical hurdles that happened during the production of this film? Um, some of the logistical hurdles, well, I mean... Well, the night shoot in the restaurant, that was pretty tough. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was tough. There were there were certain there were certain things, I mean, there was nothing that was, there was nothing that really stands out as like, 
as really difficult. Um, we have a really cohesive team in general. So, um, and Kellen and I like to do a lot of forethought leading up to shoots. So um, there wasn't anything that really stands out as, a, as like a make it or break it kind of moment. Um, there's just a lot of prep. And then again, we have a really cohesive team. So everyone kind of, everyone works together really nicely and it ended up being a pretty smooth project if I remember correctly. I, I think one of the, the most interesting things that when we were shooting, uh, we had a house that we wanted to, that we had to use, not like we had the opportunity to use it. And uh, we were looking for locations and um, uh, Rochelle was the one that told me like, how can we use this location and utilize it to the best of its ability mm -hmm. and use it for whatever we need it to. And we were able to turn that into, you know, multiple, multiple sets in the movie, which was pretty crazy. So that's all her. <laughs> I, was, I didn't want to do it. That's, that's less of a logistical problem more of me being like, hi, here's this house. And then you have to creatively <laughs> turn it into the space. Yeah. <laughs> we had such a great um, like set deck gal who I think brought so much to really making all of those spaces look really unique and different. And I don't think you can necessarily tell that like the psychiatrist's office is the same as you know, the backyard, it's all, it's all like the same location. It's the same house. So she did a really nice job with that. Totally. So yeah, Sarah, my next question is for you. Uh, yeah. Like what was your process for creating a, such a multifaceted character? She was so complex. So mm -hmm. what were your, what was your thought process? Yeah. Um, I guess I really tried to explore what it would be like if I did have so much crammed into my head. So what I really tried to do was flesh out um, a really good backstory um, and have a really good idea of like what it was that was going through her head um, at every point in all of the scenes. Um, so it didn't feel like, um, you in there? you know, something that she was hearing that didn't make any sense necessarily with what was being said in the scene at that time. Um, so I worked a lot on that. Um, and then specifically how I felt towards Richard's character um, at specific points during the script as well, so that that really changed and altered and hopefully you could kind of tell. So speaking of Richard's character, like how was it taking on the, on the different stages that you, you went through all these multiple timelines? Richard. Well, um, like Sarah was saying, it's just knowing before the scene exactly what you know and uh, who you know. Um, the relationship with Sarah completely changes. I mean, one moment I don't know who she is, the next moment she's the most precious thing in my world. And of course, the way it's written, the times where I need her most are the times she's least available. So. There's always tension, and uh, that was that was a a wonderful thing to experience to have that kind of tension immediately. Um, it wasn't that hard to uh, imagine um, what that's like. Basically, um, feeling like you have a daughter mm -hmm. that doesn't recognize you, or then you discover you have a daughter that doesn't recognize you, and so these are extremely emotional. Um, compelling situations and it was a great thing to imagine and uh, um you know it was, it was it was it was as much fun as it could possibly be for this kind of a, a tense relationship it was a, it was a pleasure um, everybody worked so well together anyway yeah yeah in creating the the tone of this film uh not only uh, we need the, the, the work of great actors, but also a, a great DP that needs to, uh, mm -hmm. to figure out how to set the tone and, uh, you know, make the, the, the movie the way it is. So Marty, like, uh, what was your approach to creating that tone? Is it like the, the collaboration between the DP and the director important, like to your lighting and your staging process? Yeah, for the most part, I mean, Kellen and I talk back and forth, um, I mean, months in advance. I mean, pretty much up until the day. We make changes on how we're going to do things. It all kind of just depends on how we're feeling, or I guess what we feel needs to be, you know, said in the movie itself. 
So, I mean, honestly, it's a collaboration between the two of us. And that's kind of what helps me, I guess, in the moment, you would say, like, the first day we get there, it kind of establishes that tone. And I feel like me and Kellen working together on that first day, that sets, like, the tone for the rest of the shoot. Um, so it's kind of a mix of, like, yeah, working with the two of us, setting the tone, and then a little bit of what I do, what Kellen does, that all kind of comes together. So I'm not going to say it's, like, perfect at all, but it does come together in the end. Right. Marty, does, does, did you have a, um, is it nerve wracking the first day shooting that? Huh? Is it nerve wracking the first day coming onto set when you were setting that tone? I'd say it's always nerve wracking the first day in any shoot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, again, that's where you establish like the tone or at least like, I mean, I know like as far as like actors, like I'm sure you go through it like over and over again before, but still like the first day, at least to me, still sets the tone even as much as I prep, there's something that happens that day or something that changes it to be not exactly what you thought it would be, but pretty close, or if not close, but somewhat different to what you would want it to be. I think that's pretty, I would say that's probably the same in almost any department. It's the same for actors, I think, Richard, as you, you prep, 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 you have an idea of what it's gonna be like on the day, but what you then have to be flexible for is what everybody else brings to it. Yeah. Um, and so it it naturally changes and morphs into something. Um, and that's what's so beautiful when you finally get on set and you start working with other people is you see how yeah. the DP wants to shoot it and what the lights look like. You see what the set is gonna be, you know, it, it all kind of starts to mesh together and you have to be flexible and kind of move with that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a ping pong, you know, I mean, obviously you don't know what the other actors are going, going to give you. Yeah. And uh, um, not to, to blow up your head more than already is Sarah, but um, you know, when you're so emotionally full and all I have to do is respond to you, it's the best thing in the world. It's so, you know, I don't have to work. Yeah. I don't have to work. It's so great. Ditto. And, um, Thank you. And, and then when Marty and, and Kellen are working together, I mean, you could tell the ideas bouncing off each other or you discover things in the moment with the lighting, the setup, the people you have around you, some angle or something. I could see that you guys were creating, even though you had a storyboard or a shot list, there was room for improvisation that you guys were inspired in the moment to try something different in the moment, if you had the time. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, it's very important because when you come from a script to, to screen, the things change so much. And, and, you know, you go through three stages of a film where you go from writing to production where it can completely change. And then you go to editing where it can change even more. Uh, and you have to be able to, to roll with those things. You almost have to forget the ideas of what you wanted as a film because, because it can hold you back. You can, you can get so caught up on, on what it might have been that you might forget what it can be. Um, and that's and that's part of everything. I think you guys said it m better than I did, but like it's all it's all stages. It's all uh, departments, you know. And then that changes again in the edit, Tyler. To you. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, I mean, Kellen and Marty kind of set it up so well. I didn't really have to change too much. Um, I think Kellen might actually remember more of uh, sitting in the editing bay more than me, <laughs> but it was it was pretty clear cut, you know, just kind of laying them laying them all in. The I mean, hardest part after that was then just really tweaking everything. Like I think we probably spent some of the most time being uh, the part where they go right into the flashback and then the very last scene. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. like with with the uh, with this uh, non-linear narrative structure that exists in the film, like how hard was it to uh, make the first cut, the rough cut? Was it something difficult for you? Uh, it was probably difficult in the sense that that's definitely not a story I've done before. Um, this was the most non-linear story. Uh, but even so, I feel like the story moves at a pretty good pace, and I think that's kind of owed to uh, Kellen's writing for it. Mm -hmm. that it's pretty easily followed. Great. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> One of the main uh, uh, features that we see uh, in this in this film is like the music. Music is so mm -hmm. prominent in this film and it's that's due to the score that Isaiah has made. 
So what was the driving force for this score? Are there any uh, light motifs or particular instruments that you use? Um, yeah, they are actually. Um, although you don't hear them as much in short films, there are actually two themes I wrote, one for Sarah's character and Richard's character. Um, Sarah's is actually a bit more childlike just because I wanted to play to the, the her curiosity and wonder at first at having this gift and then one for Richard kind of foreshadowed what was going to happen. And this is the recurring chord progression, um, which it's it's more difficult to do in short films because you have less time <clears throat> to make your case. Um, but working with Kellen, I think people already have alluded to here that it's by the time you get to do your part, the job seems uh, almost too easy, where it's like it's been set up properly, where you don't really have much to do. Um, so you don't. Uh, get that opportunity very often. Kelly and I have worked uh, with each other for seven, eight years plus. Um, so I already know how he thinks. Mm -hmm. And uh, even when I'm coming in at the very last parts of the production process, I sort of already know um, what he's expecting. And like Tyler was saying, anything that I need to fix, it's minute or small. Uh, uh, Kellen's very particular about certain details that um, enhance the story and it goes with the uh, editing as well as with the music so uh, it was pretty straightforward yeah um, it's, uh, it's interesting with with isaiah's when we were younger when we were working together i used to i feel like i would send you a lot of references for stuff and constantly shoot stuff over to you but we've gotten to a point now that when we get into the like after we film, film, film the film and gone into like uh, post production, I just forget. I just send it over to you and honestly let you go. It's such a comfortable relationship that I can just like Isaiah will handle this. We've done our, our everything and, and he'll be able to. It's exciting, you know. You 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 reinvigorate the film. Uh, you bring that life to it that I can't really imagine. You know, um, I I can give you references and everything, but there's only so much that that will do. But when you bring that music to it there's times where I'm like, okay, now I see the film. Now I can feel the uh, the, te the texture that we were missing in this, you know? So yeah, now yeah. that we have uh, finished this, this first round of questions, I'm uh, gonna go to the live chat and see some of the things that uh, the, the viewers have, uh, have asked you. So first off, Roland Shorter uh, asked uh, Callan, how do you come up with dr dramatic shots such as the multiple reflection shot towards the beginning and the last shot in the restaurant. That's also for Marty, perhaps. So uh, why don't you uh, guys talk about that? Is, do you want to take it, Marty? How do you, go for it. No, I was going to say, we, we storyboarded that like way ahead of time. So that was, that was actually your idea. So you can take off on that one. <laughs> uh, no, it, it, it's a process of taking the script and trying to figure out what's going to be the best to uh, transmit your idea, right? Like to get to communicate it to your audience. And you have to, you kind of have to take it from a direct, because I write and direct both things. Uh, so I have a predetermined idea when I write it, um, but I try and take that hat off and approach it as how is this going to communicate this the best way. Um, and, and that's where I start to go. And I start to, I start to look at like, what is, like there's a motif that's used in in this for visually that I at the beginning of the film Sarah and Richard are shot over the same shoulder throughout throughout and then when we come out of the um, the memory stuff the shoulders flip because the perspective has flipped between the two um, and it's very subtle but I think it, there's this like subconscious thing that happens to you when you see them from a different side or you see them from the opposite perspective you've been watching them the whole time. Um, and little things like that is it's it's all about communicating that idea and and what are the best ways to do it and what are the ways that they're not going to be too high concept that people don't understand that they're just going to feel it like dolly pushes or like when you have those intense moments you, you want to feel the character moving in on the character or like uh, yeah just just anything that's going to enhance that moment for the audience and make them feel you know in, engaged into this this picture. Mm -hmm. What, so, uh, what about, about lighting? Do, do you, is there anything with that that you, 
that you take to to make those look that way? I'm curious because I don't I don't do much of the like anything with the lighting. I just kind of hand it over to Modi. Um, I'm curious, like when we do that, what what do you think on the lighting side? Uh, I mean, I already have like a, a idea of how I'm gonna light it, and so honestly, it's just like when you're there, it's just troubleshooting and finding out what works best for like a reflection or something like that. Um, we're kind of just working with yeah reflections, making sure they're not like in your way of what you were gonna do. If it was, you have to kind of rearrange on what you're gonna do. It's kind of the fun in it. You know, it's like we said, you can plan and plan and plan, but you know, you put a mirror there and it shows like everybody that's working on the entire shoot and then you have to rearrange the entire room or whatever, or, you know, production design has to fix it. Um, Cause I was trying to think actually, so the, the reflections, didn't you, did you have one or did you have multiple in the storyboard? I forgot. Reflections? Like, yeah, we were in the, the scene where there's like three of them, I think there's like three mirrors. Was there one or was there three in the storyboard? There's one. There's that's one. Also what I'm saying is like, somehow it ended up being like multiple and it's like, that was great. But that's kind of just something that happens when you get there. Yeah. Yeah. The lighting, yeah. It, I do go in there with like something already set in my head, but again, I have to kind of adjust based on what happens on the day. Sure. Yeah. Good. Marty, do you ever get stressed? <laughs> Honestly, I'm stressed all the time. I just don't show it. I mean, he really doesn't. He's like the coolest cucumber you'll meet. I always say like silent but deadly. You don't even know that he's doing what he's doing and he's never looked stressed, but um, I'm always so impressed with how quickly and efficiently everything gets done and you don't even notice it's happening. Well, it's you so stressed and everyone else gets stressed. You gotta keep cool. <laughs> Captain <the> shit, man. <laughs> That's great. So uh, the next question comes from uh, Jory Janeway and she asks, what was the process like to find a kid and a teen to look like Sarah's character? Yeah, go for that. That's you. Um, oh, well, we had a few restrictions there. I, I think we did a decent job. Um, because we are a short film and had a smaller budget, um, that also meant that we didn't have endless number of people to kind of choose from. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what what Kellen and I decided was we needed people who were really solid actors first and foremost. And I think the audience forgives a little bit. Like if, if you tell a good story and you let people be in their imagination, like they will forgive some things. Um, so we really, I think, focused on having really good solid actors. And our youngest actually, Gabby, she came from Colorado. She came all the way out from Colorado to be a part of this, which was amazing. And she's so cute and incredible. Um, and Sarah was local to LA. The, the teenager, her name is also Sarah. So we just kind of figured it was meant to be. Um, so really it's just kind of putting out on a breakdown. We did a picture of myself so people knew kind of the look that we needed. Um, they submit to that, and then you just pull people who you think kind of might work, um, and then start looking at you know the talent um, and what we kind of needed for the film, and you just keep narrowing it down, and you make a choice at the end. So, so uh, the next question is for Sarah and Richard, and it, it's a question from Roland. Uh, so, what were your uh, method, methods for achieving that level of sadness in the film and reaching the point of tears? Richard? Well, you had more tears than me. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Kellen gave you more tears. Um, okay. No, um, I think it's a very easy um, story to. Um, well, I'm a father of a daughter in real life. So um, it's, it's not that hard to imagine um, what that would be to lose that relationship. So um, it's a sad place to go. So as an actor, you're just asked to go there. And um, it's, a, it's a pretty, I mean, looking at the film while well, you just were screening, because I hadn't seen it for a while, I thought about that late night shoot we had in the restaurant where you're the waitress and um, where I'm so desperate to um, to connect with you. And uh, 
I don't know. It's just it's just, it's just a place that I think also because you're somewhat feeling tired and fatigued and but you know as an actor you're prepared. You know the story. You know the relationship. You know what what you are there to do. What you hope to achieve. And then, um, fortunately, um, working with Sarah, um, just kind of um, feeding off of her confusion and then feeding off of her need in the therapist office and then my needs when I'm first approaching her in the apartment and I'm stalking her. And it was a, it was a, it's a beautifully written story and it wasn't very hard to... Uh, to imagine um, that emotional crisis, um, it, even though it's a fantastic story, it, it 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 still is somewhat believable. I mean, it's almost as if I don't know that you have dementia in a way. That you're, I mean, in a way, I guess realistically, you're almost thinking it's dementia. You're you're forgetting who this person is, or you're remembering who this person is, and that person doesn't remember you. So it's this. So you can play it in a very re realistic way, you know, as if you, you're dealing with someone you love who has Alzheimer's and they don't recognize you. I mean, it's very believable, sadly. I mean, it's not that far-fetched. So um, you just allow yourself to go there. Yeah. I think Richard said all the key points. I, as an actor, I think establishing your needs, your wants is so important. And that's what you're focusing on. I think so. The worst thing that ever happens is with when you show up on set and the director says, "Okay, now cry." It's like the, the worst thing if somebody just puts the pressure of like what they want you to do um, instead of what's underneath it. Which Kellen and I had a couple of chats about that kind of before we got on set. He was so great about asking like, "How do you like to work? How can I help you?" Um, kind of on the day. Uh, so we had a nice language, I think, going before we got on set. Um, and then like Richard said, it's establishing the person that you're opposite of and having a great scene partner helps. And then just letting all of that homework and all that prep go away. I mean, you have to do it, but then you're on set and you just have to be there with the person that you're talking to and not worry about what's going to happen um, and not force anything that's going to happen. I think that's always so important. Um, and what Kellen did for the therapist scene, which was so nice, and I think he's discovered how I like to work, is instead of cutting after every scene, we just kind of did, did the take and then went right back to the beginning. Yeah. Instead of resetting everything and taking a moment, we just kind of kept running through it as if it were like a theater piece almost. Um, and that was really helpful because you just kind of stay in that headspace. Um, but for me, it was so easy to just look at Richard and feel those feelings and I, I could barely imagine what it would be like if your own father who you like love and adore just looked at you and, and had no idea who you were I mean that is just gut-wrenching I think on its own so um it's not that hard to to be in that particular headspace for me I, I would say yeah just uh goes to show how complex this script is and you know how mm -hmm. emotionally uh how you guys have to have to be connected emotionally and you know have get great chemistry in order to uh, pull mm -hmm. off this uh, this great performances so uh, the next question comes from uh, Diego Medellin and he says uh, I'm a firm believer that a film is a machine and everything needs to be working correctly in order to mm -hmm. achieve perfection and music is such an important factor so mm -hmm. Isaias tell us about your inspiration and your main drive for this particular piece my main drive was the deadline. <laughs> and the paycheck. And the paycheck. No, <laughs> no um, as I said before, uh, the process gets uh, easier um, if everything was done uh, incredibly well before that. So uh, I come in very late into the process, so everybody else has already moved on to their ne next projects, and I'm getting to know the characters for the first time. Um, and yeah, the, the process, uh, the inspiration is really just watching the film. Uh, first alone, I like to have my, my own personal reaction before watching it then with the director, Kellen, and then seeing his perspective. And then, um, especially working with Kellen, I've learned to kind of trust my instincts a bit more. So usually my first idea is the best idea. 
rather than writing five or six different versions and kind of killing myself for it. Um, so that's that's a plus uh, working with a team like this. And yeah, the inspiration is really just uh, watching the film uh, a bunch of times over and making sure I don't get in the way of the performances. And if there are very little, there are small parts where I can enhance it a bit um, and make the narrative work a bit better with the music, then um, I'll, I'll add my part. Yeah, so uh, Diego has another question, uh, this time for the cast, like how much imp improv were you allowed on set? Like how much liberty do you get when you're working with such a tight and perfect script like this? Uh, how much did you? I don't know. I don't think there was any improv, really. I mean, the improv, I guess, came in the rehearsal. Sure. Yeah. Maybe there was a few. I don't know if there was some any kind of word changes, but the script was pretty intact. You guys really prepped the script for a while. You had a lot of preparation, so it was a pretty tight script. And I don't think there was. I mean, maybe a word or two were changed, but. Um, Aside from the behavioral uh, discoveries, I, I think the actual dialogue was pretty intact, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I don't, I don't feel like either of us necessarily felt a need for improv either. Maybe we did. We played with some of the things in rehearsal a bit, and I know we talked quite extensively about the therapist scene because I was very worried about it sounding just expositional. Mm -hmm. um, so I know we, we talked through that quite a bit and played with that scene a little bit, but I don't think we'd really had much improv on set. We were, I think, pretty comfortable with what, what we wanted to do. You know, we rehearsed. The rehearsals yeah. account for so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the key Love to it. everything. If you can have people off script and able to play and um, really uh, find out what you're doing. And of course, you guys, Marty and Kellen, are working on the camera and then you're working with us as the, the actors and getting the right tone. Mm -hmm. I think uh, this, you don't want to have a whole lot of surprises on the set and, uh, and um, it, was, uh, it was pretty tight. I think uh, we kind of worked out all the bumps in rehearsal for the most part. Yeah. Well, that's, the, that's kind of the key is you, you're spending time in a film, film is, uh, or time is money in a yeah. film set. So the goal is to get everything where we want it to in rehearsal. I mean, there's there's certain nuances and certain things that pop up, you know, on the day that make it exciting and, and that kind of uh, add some sparks to it. But um, getting it to, you know, the beats of, of the blocking and, and where you want it, that's all discovered in rehearsal. And that's like, that's 90% of the work. And then on the day you get the, it's like a sports player. You practice, practice, practice. <laughs> On the day, just let people be and if you practice enough then then you know it'll come naturally to you and you don't have to think about it and that's kind of how i like to do it mm -hmm. great uh so uh this next question comes from myri huli and she asks isaias uh how do you create the richness of the orchestra and do you have a team that helps bring it to life uh no it's all done uh through my computer it's uh Virtual sampled orchestral libraries have become indistinguishable from the real thing, which is in a way great and another and on the other side sad because uh, there are less and less recordings with live musicians nowadays. Um, obviously it's expensive, but it, it's hard to replace. Um, so you do the best you can with the tools you have. The richness, um, when you have a computer and you've got thousands of instruments at your disposal, and a blank canvas is usually the, the worst thing possible for a composer because you don't know where to start. Um, so sometimes you have to, the best way for me is to limit, limit myself to the kinds of sounds and instruments that um, I want to use and then flesh it out accordingly. Um, and yeah, it's just a, it's good to work with limitations, I think. And um, I think I can say that not just for music, but for all parts of the um, filmmaking process. Yeah, uh, we see uh, great composers like Anne Zimmer also, also, also uh, talking about using some of those uh, sample libraries. So we, we're seeing a shift in, even in big project, projects uh, about those being used. So uh, this last mm -hmm. question comes from uh, Alvaro Ortega, and it's for Tyler. Uh, 
So this short d uh, depicts a world uh, with very complex and unique rules and did you have to work in the edit on how and when the information about the rules of that world were delivered to the audience? Um, that's a pretty good question. Uh, there were certain rules we did have to kind of abide by because essentially you could kind of think of Greer's power as like a, like a superpower and you know she wants to keep her identity a secret and that's why the diner scene is kind of shocked to her at first. And, you know, so I think the first inkling of like a rule per se is um, Richard's character says something like, uh, like, I want you to get rid of her. And then Greer responds with, you're not supposed to remember. So that's kind of the first inkling that she understands, you know, the rules of her own powers. And I'd say as far as kind of, you know, my job in revealing that or not, that was uh, probably just a good writing of the script, because that's only really the first notion of someone else knowing about her secret. And I'd say as far as uh, like hiding that or not, um, I think that was probably up to the script, really. So uh, I know I said that, that was the last question, but I have another one. And this one's for Kellen and Rochelle. Uh, so um, what's the future for uh, Frame of Reference uh, Entertainment? What other projects do you have coming forward? Thank you. <laughs> uh, so we are actually, um, we're supposed to be uh, shooting a feature in June here. Um, thank you, coronavirus. Um, but I mean, you know, it just gives us more time to be that much more prepped and, and you know, the film will be that much, not much better for it, but, um, um, yeah, we have, we have, we have a few things in the works that are, that are, I mean, that, that are going to be pushed a little bit now, but, um, once, you know, we're all, once the world is a safer place and we can, and people can gather again, um, then we can, then we're going to get the team together and make some, make some cool art. The, um, it's pretty interesting because all these people in this chat are part of the feature we're working on. Um, so here is part of our team, <laughs> along with other people that aren't in here, but they, this is the, the same creative team is going to be tackling the feature. Um, and we're all really excited for that, uh, to, to start doing that because I think it's time uh, to get to the long form content and, and to see what we can do on that end. Because uh, I think every single one of these people here is a force to be reckoned with in the industry. Um, and I'm excited to see them, you know, tackle that, that big uh, mountain that we have to do. Uh, so it'll be really fun. Uh, and I, I can't wait to, to uh, spend how many 18 plus days shooting a movie and dealing with all that. <laughs> we'll still be friends. Nah. <laughs> We'll have to do a lot of Zoom rehearsals, you know? Yeah, right? that's right. <laughs> Next step, Zoom rehearsal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's going to be fun. I, I, I can't wait to to get that. And I'm, I'm pretty excited for, you know, what we have in store. Mm -hmm. Story-wise, um, should I tease it? Can I tease it a little bit? What do you think? <laughs> yeah? Anybody? Rachel? <laughs> Don't hate me. If I mean, <laughs> just call, right? Why not? um the so it's a it's kind of similar to the stuff we've done like this is the same team that if you guys have seen it is the same team behind uh, the moment i was alone uh except for richard and sarah and tyler um me and Isaiah uh, are the same i guess it's not the same team some of them are the same team uh that we've had uh before and with the moment i was alone it's it's kind of this uh fantasy drama that kind of takes place in this abstract fantastical world same thing in the mind's eye where it's this, you know, uh, fantastical world, fantastical abilities. Um, so with, with the feature, we're taking this story about a girl who uh, wakes up in a different body every day uh, and is trying to understand how she got there and uh, where that takes her. I think that's a good enough teaser. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be really fun and we have, we, you know, all these people involved and, uh, and we're excited to, show you that one <laughs> i think kellen and 
Rachel, they're so good about always taking, um, like he's saying, these kind of fantastical worlds and situations and then making it something that's very real and relatable, which um, oh. is kind of the nice thing about everything that they do. So while it's like a crazy situation or maybe something that you've seen or heard of before, the way that everybody reimagines it and um, really makes it something that's really personal, I think is what is always so beautiful about what they do. Well, gifts, you know, I always like the idea. I said this to someone that asked me about it and they were talking about the feature and it's, it's wondering like gifts are gifts. You know, we have a lot of superhero movies that come out and, and gifts are just a fantastic thing. These abilities are these gifts to them. Uh, but what happens when that gift becomes a curse? And, you know, same thing within the mind's eye, same thing with the moment I was alone. It's, it's where, how far can you take this? And there's always an opposite side of that. You know, it's not always good and happy and exciting. There's some places you can go that are not so good, um, as we can see Magical in this realism, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just saw that come up. Magical realism. That's a good way to describe that. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, uh, yeah. thank you all for, for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, Q and A. Uh, in case you uh, you have missed the film the first time we uh, we, sh we broadcast it, uh, we're gonna do it again now after the Q and A. So uh, thanks everyone for watching and thank you all for uh, being here for the Q and A.